Hey everybody, here we are in chapter 20, our final chapter um, for this Art 203. And I'm kind of cheating a little bit here because um, chapter 20 is kind of on the, the cusp between early art history and, you know, art history from 1500 and beyond and with all the Renaissance and all of that. So this is a really Renaissance and I find that I really relate to this. Uh, it's so memorable to me from what I've learned in art history. And I feel like this is kind of like a cool teaser um, for art history too. So I hope I'm gonna see a lot of you there. And again, we've got some great topics here for discussion and a timeline, just everything encapsulated into one little page. And here is our map, the Holy Roman Empire still happening, <laughs> France and England, the Ottoman Empire, you know, so, um, and Spain. So we see all of these, um, early um, areas in the map. Oh, there we have the Burgundy, important region. Okay, so Roger van der Weyden, um, this is St. Luke drawing the Virgin. The likely patron of this artwork is the City Artist Guild. We're going to learn a lot more about guilds a little bit later. This is like um, so weird to me how how early artists depicted babies. It looks like a little tiny man rather than a cute and chubby baby. So I think that, you know, advances are to come. <laughs> um, this is an artwork by Klaus Sluter. The Well of Moses. The reason why the Well of Moses did not actually spout water is the Carthusian commitment to silence, which would be more important than water sounds. Okay, so silence was so important um, to um, visit this artwork. The fountain created by Klaus Sluter for the cloister of Chartreuse de Champmol in Dijon is meant to symbolize the font of everlasting life. So font, another word for fountain. Okay, here we have the Virgin and Child, again at the Chartreuse de Champmont. I, you know, I wonder of the, wonder where the color name Chartreuse came from, because it doesn't look Chartreuse. <laughs> A dynastic symbol of Burgundy. Bar yeah, hold on. I don't, <laughs> I can't say it. A dynastic symbol of Burgundian power is the Chartreuse de Chambon. Okay, there I got it. Uh, this is a re-table or ra-table. Uh, ra-table. Ra-table or re-table, which is a frame or a shelf including decorated panels um, or revered objects that were placed above or behind an altar. This artwork is the Rat Table of Champol, uh, closed. So it's like a piece of furniture, you know, it closes and it opens up. Okay, really important artwork here. The Les Lettres Riche Ours du Duc de Berry. <laughs> That's my French accent for you, by the Limburg brothers. Okay, so um, these were calendar pages in a book of hours. And we remember that book of hours from the medieval times. So the calendar pages of Lettre Riche Urs de Duc de Berry, they show scenes of courtly life. So imagine um, rich people. Uh, and then they also had lists of seasonal tasks. 
It was the noble patron Jean, the Duke of Berry, who commissioned Les Trich Rich Ears. <laughs> I'm doing I'm butchering it. Uh, a great achievement of Le Tre Riche Ears was that it made manuscripts more closely resemble panel paintings. So remember the earlier illuminated manuscripts that we've been studying. Now we've got, it appears to be like a panel painting. The illusionism found in French manuscript painting was influenced by contact from Italy. So like illusionism, they're talking about, we, sh we see near, we see far, things that are in the distance appear to be farther away. An influence of Chantilly. Okay, so Chantilly, this is France, um, but influenced by the Italians. Okay, another page of that same book. The activities on this page are shown from October. So October, you know, you're, imagine the farmers clearing up the field and preparing it for, you know, the cold winter. The artistic trend that cont contributed to the decentralization of religious practice is the availability of books of hours. So um, it wasn't such a, I don't know, an elitist kind of a thing in religion anymore. It was like everyone could do this. Everyone could read these books. So it, um, it opened it up to the public. All right, here we have Burgundy. So Burgundy is really important because the most, most powerful Northern European rulers during much of the 15th century were the Dukes of Burgundy. In the 15th century, the Dukes of Burgundy wielded power over the country of Flanders. That just makes me think of, I think it's the Simpsons, Flanders. Flanders was a region of Belgium. The people were known as Flemish. The bodies who controlled artistic production in Flanders during the early Renaissance period in Northern Europe were known as guilds. So kind of like um, uh, the Actors Guild, you know. So they also had the Artist Guild back in this time period. Robert Campin, the master of Flamel. Well, the term that describes portraits of individuals that accompany religious scenes is donor portraits. So these people over here were the donors and they wanted to be in the painting, <laughs> even though this is a religious scene, right? Um, the donors uh, or the patrons are pictured in the scene as well. Triptychs, this is a triptych, so it's like a three part scene and altar pieces are able to be distinguished by size. Okay, really important artwork here, the Ghent altar piece. The artists were Jan van Eyck and Hubert. Just notice Hubert, kind of like Cher, our prince. Oil paints differ from tempera paints in that they are easier to rework. So this period, we start to see more oil, oil painting. Okay, so the last image, this image is the altarpiece closed. And here it is open. Oh my gosh, what a piece of furniture, right? So this quote, pure river of water of life, clear as crystal proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. This was a phrase from Revelations, and it is depicted in the altar of the Lamb from the Ghent altarpiece. So, so they're showing this scene from the Bible. Okay, this is another Jan van Eyck. My favorite. I was so impressed. And if you just go in a little bit deeper and do a scan of his artworks, they are so incredible. They'll just blow you away. So I highly recommend actually um, visiting the museums that hold his works. 
because even in person, they'll just blow you away. So, and the thing that happened with Jan van Eyck during this period is that, so court painters and people who were hired by, you know, rich people, they were paid by the hour. So people like Jan van Eyck figured this out, you know, okay, well, I'm going to spend uh, about a thousand hours on this painting and I'm going to be paid by the hour. So very smart, and, and it accounts for a lot of the detail. Okay, another super famous artwork by Jan van Eyck. Giovanni Ar Arnolfini and his wife, also known as the Arnolfini double portrait, because this includes a self-portrait of the artist. And if you see a close-up of the mirror in the artwork, incredibly detailed and you can see the artist has portrayed himself very small okay so I love seeing the fashion this um, the way she's holding her tummy here it's like a indicator of fertility I don't know if she was pregnant but that's like that's what it's supposed to mean and then the dog is uh, a symbol of fidelity so he is good man i love his sandals and he is faithful to his wife so almost like um um pr right propaganda another jan van eyck super famous this is the first known western portrait in which the sitter looks directly at the viewer created by jan van eyck um, and another Banderweeden, so beautiful, just like, you know, she looks like a supermodel. Okay, this is the deposition by Banderweeden. Uh, he painted this panel to resemble relief carving, so that's interesting. And another Van der Weeden, very important artist. The artist here, Petrus Christus, um, he painted a goldsmith in his shop. So fascinating to see, you know, what people were wearing, uh, what a store looked like, or, you know, an artist's workshop. Amazing. And Derek Bouts, altarpiece of the Holy Sacrament. The focus of Derek Bouts' depiction of the Last Supper, Last Supper in his altarpiece. So here we see the Last Supper of the Holy Sacrament is the liturgical rite of the Eucharist. So um, liturgical artworks we've seen in ancient Egypt as well. Okay, this is another Derek Bouts. Again, look at that fashion. Okay, another, another Bouts. Okay, Hugo Vandergoes. We see a lot of <clears throat> Hugo. So this is a really important piece. It was painted by Hugo Vandergoes, as it says, to enhance the meaning of the main event portrait portrayed the Portinari altarpiece, which is this piece, includes subsidiary scenes in the background, such as the arrival of the Magi. This artist, Hugo van der Goes, re revived medieval pictorial devices by including small background scenes and a varied scale of figures. So here we see the people in the distance. So varying the scale, you know, makes them appear to be farther away. Um, this Florentine artist um, that we'll be learning about coming up if you're going to take Art History too, in the Renaissance, Domenico Gerlandeo, he reproduced a motif from the Portinari altarpiece in one of his own works. Okay, Hans Memling, he's the artist who specialized in images of the Madonna and Child. 
Okay, so this is really what he did. Every artwork is about the Madonna and Child. And he was known for that. The title of this artwork, or altarpiece, by Hans Memling is the St. John Altarpiece. Okay, here's another Hans Memling. It's a diptych. So triptych would be three panels, a diptych is two. Um, so thinking about those, um, what do we call them? Prefix, prefixes like die, try. Um, this city, Bruges, that derived its wealth from the wool trade and expanded it into banking. So we hear more about this in like Shakespeare's works. So Bruges. Here's another Hans Memling. Um, this is the Tomaso Portinari and Maria Baroncelli, the artist who served as the Dean of the Painters Guild of Ghent and worked for Toma Tom Tomaso. Portinari is Hugo van der Goes. So Hugo van der Goes worked for this guy. Okay, this is so weird to me. All right, I see so much going on here. This is so fascinating. So the title of this work is uh, The Melon Diptych by Jean Fouquet, the artist who created Agnes Sorrel, which is this lady, the mistress of King Charles VII, the model for the Madonna in his painting of the Virgin and Child. So this was a real person. You know, she was like a model. And she was the model for the virgin and child. And what's so weird to me is, okay, so here we have her breast revealed. So she's going to be breastfeeding. But there's like no nipple on her breast. I don't know if nipple would have been not allowed. And then the monks over here, those hairstyles, wow very bizarre and and also like her hair is so tightly pulled back you see that but goodness gracious it looks like she doesn't have hair at all so very fascinating artwork okay this is the miraculous draft of fish um the painting was created in the Ro the roman empire the holy roman empire so here we are back in rome the two entities that divided the Burgundian territories after the death of Charles the Bold are France and the Holy Roman Empire. So fascinating that it was still around. Um, and yeah, and still Rome exists, of course. One thing that is significant about the landscape in this miraculous draft of fish by Conrad Witz is that it shows a specific place on the shore of Lake Geneva. So it's like a real depiction of a real location. Okay, Madonna in the Rose Garden. Another altarpiece. Okay, Tillman Ryman Schneider. This unpainted Rotable or raw table was painted by Tillman Ryman Schneider. In Ryman Schneider's Assumption of the Virgin, the artist successfully incorporated Gothic intricacy. Amazing. And here we've got a hand colored woodcut. So, like a print. Um, the wood would have been carved and then inked and then pressed. Okay, here we have an image from the Nuremberg Chronicle. So here, it's a book. Um, the method that was used to create this image is woodcut. So again, a piece of wood would have been carved and inked and then pressed onto the paper to make as many images, you know, as you needed. It is produced, a woodcut is produced by the relief method of printing. The topic of this Nuremberg Chronicle is a tribute to the new craft of the printed illustrated book. 
um, it is. And it showed the history of the world. So, you know, during this time period, they're looking back on history. Okay, this is St. Anthony tormented by the demons. This is an engraving. So this would have been like a, a burn would have been used to incise the metal. So cut into it. And we've heard about burns all the way back to um, the Paleolithic period. Remember that uh, antler that was incised by a burn? Um, and so everything... Um, that, you know, all of the lines here would have had to have been carved into the metal. And then it was inked and printed. So lots of techniques here. Uh, cross hatching, those little crossing of lines, would have been used uh, for shading. It's a device that was used in engraving to show, like, different values, different shades. Uh, the techniques that Martin Schongauer used to create tonal varieties and textures in his, in, in, in his engraving of St. Anthony are lines of varying thickness and density, cross-hatching to describe forms. So, you know, you, when you have shading you, you and highlights, you create form and in size, size lines into a copper plate with a burn. Cool. Okay, here we have a couple additional notes. And finally, some discussion questions.